Hello and welcome to the Extremist Publishing Podcast. I'm Tom Christie. Our guest today is Ed Dixon, author of Tales from the Western Front, an anthology of real-life stories of some remarkable figures who fought and lived during the Great War. I think it's fair to say, Ed, that uh, this is a a project which has had a a long period of inception. Yes, it is. Uh, Really, I suppose, it all started back in a a bleak January day at Grangemouth High School in 1981, when my colleague, uh, Malcolm McKeever, suggested or said, we're going to the battlefields, and as head of history, you're going to be the one to lead it. And so it took off from there. And school trips to the battlefields continued until 1996. That was the last one. Um, And after that, uh, interest died a bit. But I, I kept going myself, and sometimes with Malcolm, sometimes with my wife. So I kept going until 2012. And after that, uh, I've had to curtail them. But that was when it, that's how it happened. But the actual writing of the book, that's where the interest in the uh, First World War came from, was from these school educational excursions. But where the writing of the book took off was on a nice summer's afternoon in May 2004, I was cutting the grass and... A gentleman came up to me uh, and started to speak and he was canvassing for votes for the local Labour Party, uh, really for himself, in the forthcoming uh, borough elections. His name was Billy Calder and we got talking and I asked him, because just by his setup, I thought he's been in the army and in fact he had been. He then asked me, were you in the army? And I said, no, I hadn't been. Uh, and it took off from there. Uh, he said, I told him about the what I was doing with visiting the battlefields, and he asked me if I could help him to locate the stories of the, the five Clackmannanshire VCs. And I said I didn't know anything about it, but I'd certainly try and help him. And so he, I went to the local library, went through the archives of all the local papers, the three of them, the Aloha Circular, Aloha Advertiser and Aloha Journal, all through the Great War and came up with some really quite good stories. Um, the reason that he wanted me to do this was that a constituent was encouraging him strongly to have commemorative plaques put up, like the blue plaques that the London boroughs put up on their buildings for notable people who have resided there. And so I had to check the stories of these Victoria Cross recipients, and that's how it started. What I found out was, first of all, by trawling through the archives of the local papers, was that instead of there having been five Victoria Cross uh, recipients in Clackmannanshire, there was only there were only four, and it was the fifth one, the one who was was not a resident of Clackmannanshire, Cecil John Kinross, also known as Hoodoo Kinross, that that really got me interested, and I wrote a monograph about him and his adventures, and that was published a self published in two thousand and six. But by that time, I had become deeply interested in the other other stories and other people participating in the First World War, and that's how the book came about. Well, one of the things that uh, jumped out at me from reading the book was not only the figures that you uncovered from 100 years ago, but also the many people that you met uh, during your various visits to the battlefields. Yes, that was one of the great uh, bonuses of going to the battlefields. Not only the people I met through the school trips, these were the pupils and some other members of staff and then people over on the uh, continent, but uh, also the people, the natives, the residents who lived there and the French and Belgians and also uh, the English and Scots and Irish people and Welsh who would turn up 
uh, and you would run into them on the battlefields and in the pubs at night and develop relationships with them, got on the chat with them and swapped stories and it was it was all very convivial and very, very nice. The school trips were really a, a great uh, benefit to me and I'd like to think to the, the kids as well because they got to see a lot of things that not many people up until 1981 when we first took off had been to see the battlefields. Uh, there'd been a lull in interest in the First World War for a long time and it's only, it's only really recently over the last 20 years that the First World War has become a favourite uh, holiday destination for a, a, that type of tourist. Um, but that was... The people I met were some remarkable characters. The, the majority of the people that I met with regard to the First World War and the battlefields was in Ypres in Belgium at a pub called The Shell Hole. It was run by John Woolsgrove and his Belgian partner, Christine de Dane. And John was an ex-para who had fought in the Falklands conflict and when he'd come out of the army, he'd moved over. He was a Londoner when I first met him. I reckon he'd been about 45. Um, and he ran this wonderful pub, a meeting place for both locals and visitors uh, to the battlefields. They had this common shared interest. But with his personality and with the sh this mutual interest, it was a quite remarkable place. Um, it was also a bookshop and a souvenir shop, and he did well out of it. It was up a side street from the main uh, marketplace in Ypres. And in there I met many interesting characters, extremely interesting characters. Uh, amongst the locals, there was old Bill the ex-SS man who sat there. at the. He, he didn't drink, but he would have a coffee come round in the morning and sit in the, through in the breakfast room uh, and he always wore his, his uh, German soldier's hat. He was in the SS. This was a, it was a, a troubling aspect to him, as you might imagine. Um, but he was seemed a nice enough old fella and uh, he had a collection of weaponry and, and other memorabilia himself. And one of his great friends... Uh, a man of the same, about the same age, uh, called Georges, who was one of the French-speaking Flemish, and he he'd fought in the resistance, so you had two sides of the coin there. Uh, showed the legacy of the Second World War in Ypres, uh, where you don't probe down too far in the past. There were many, many other uh, people that I, I got to meet and know, and uh, the most important of whom, I suppose, were the ones that were long since gone, and I was writing their stories, and that was the point about the book, was I was commemorating people who'd interested me, amused me. So, that's the, the people that I met. You mentioned earlier Cecil Kinross, yeah. uh, the Victoria Cross holder from Canada. Yes. Um, someone who your book has helped to rightly bring back into the public eye. Yeah. Uh, which other kind of figures do you feel um, interested you the most during your research? Um, certainly John Lauder, Harry Lauder's son, because there is a mystery about his death on the battlefields. Uh, which you'll find out about in the book. The, basically, the mystery is, though, was he or was he not shot by his own men? And this can exercise people quite uh, extensively, especially over near Dunoon, where the Lauder family had their home uh, during the First World War. Um, and that really was interesting. Also, Tommy Armour, the golfer, great golfer, uh, came from Edinburgh, went to America and changed his nationality and won the British Open Golf Championship in 1931 at Carnoustie. And his story and the pickles he got himself into from time to time amused me and uh, was a, he was a very colourful character. There were also 
the Dilly Coutry BC's cousins who won the, the Victoria Cross uh, within two weeks of each other at the Battle of Lewes in 1915 for a town the size of Tilly Coutry. I think that's quite a thing to be proud of. They put up a couple of plaques to them uh, in 2015 and they're there at the High Street in Tilly Coutry to be seen by all now. John McDermott, uh, one of the other Clickman and Shire VCs, he was the very first one. He was one of the very first VCs of all time. Uh, he won it in 1854 at the Battle of Inkerman and he ended up, uh, he'd come from poverty in Clackmannan, agricultural labourer, and he ended up in poverty in a pauper's grave in Paisley. Others, Edwin Diet, uh, who was shot for supposed cowardice, desertion, an officer with the Naval Division, and he stirred in me the feelings of uh, injustice and he, it was due to him and his execution by firing squad and the furore that arose from that and the constant uh, pressure put, uh, brought in the House of Commons by an MP called Ernest Thurtle uh, that meant that nobody was shot for cowardice or desertion after that in the British Army or the British forces indeed. Um, so that was a, a tragic story, but one that was nonetheless extremely significant. Uh, the Native Canadians, what we used to call Canadian Indians, Alex Dakota and Tom Longboat, uh, coincidentally, both of them very fine long distance runners. Uh, they, uh, Dakota was killed in the First World War. Longboat uh, came home, but he was never the same man again although he did win a lot of races, including the Boston Marathon, New York Marathon. Um, but they, they, were, they were very, made a great impression on me. And I've been to visit Alex Dakota's grave up near Passchendaele. There was a, some other interesting characters, like Alan Seeger, uncle of the folk singer, and very, very big star in America, uh, Pete Seeger, uh, who wrote... Where have all the flowers gone? Um, and the Reverend Geoffrey Ancatel Studdart Kennedy, a long uh, name indeed, but shortened to Woodbine Willie because of his liking for the cigarettes, who ended up, he f survived the war. Um, he was a chaplain, but uh, he was at the front line. He, used to go, he was called Woodbine Willie because he used to go round the trenches distributing cigarettes, chocolate and this sort of thing to the troops and just giving them some comfort. And when he came home, he continued his good works working for the poor down in uh, England. And when he died, the uh, a whole lot of his former uh, troops and his parishioners came to his funeral, went to the graveside and threw woodbine cigarettes in it. Noel Chavas, the double VC from was from Liverpool, uh, or at least he was with the Liverpool Regiment, and uh, he's one of the very few men to have won the VC twice. And the Winslow Boy, famous play by Terence Rattigan, George Arthur Shea, uh, who was wrongly convicted of stealing a postal order at Dartmouth Naval College in 1908, and his father fought, bankrupted himself to clear the boy's name. He was cleared by royal assent and uh, a play was made of it and uh, the unfortunate thing is that after all the uh, efforts that were put in to clear his name, happy ending, he died in the Ypres salient and his name is amongst missing on the walls of the Menin Gate uh, Memorial. Now, it seems to me, as someone who's not a historian, that popular culture has built in the modern mind a very particular picture of the First World War, um, which has been aided by landmark historical accounts. Did you, as a result of writing your book, discover anything that challenged your assumptions about the war? There is a conflict amongst historians today. It's the butchers and bunglers and the revisionists. 
the butchers and bunglers, the, this, this is how the, the certain historians refer to the school of thought that the men were just cannon fodder and the officers lived in great chateaus behind the lines and had a grand time. That's not true, but there is an element of truth in it. But Basil Littleheart is on one side of the uh, historiography and Blackadder is basically on the same side as he is. Uh, they are of the opinion that the war was bungled, uh, could have been run better, which obviously could have been, uh, and the, there is an element of the butchers and bunglers. Troops were sacrificed to little or no avail. Um, on the other side, there are the revisionists today, university professors and, and uh, their postgraduate students who are of the opinion that the war was indeed fought very well. The British army learned a lot, which undoubtedly they did, and they were largely responsible, if not sole, not solely responsible, but largely, vastly responsible for winning the war from the lessons they learned. Well, I don't buy that one either, because there were many other reasons for the Germany losing the war, as opposed to the Allies winning it. However, th that is the th thing that leaps out at me, is how the opinions have changed over the years, because up until uh, the 1960s, when the landmark BBC television uh, programme was made about the Great War, uh, then the popular conception of it was that the troops had been unnecessarily sacrificed and the officers, especially the high-ranking officers, had made a bit of a mess of it and presiding over the whole mess was indeed General Haig. Uh, now, that has been turned on its head and the feeling is now that that is an unjust a depiction of the war. I like to think that somewhere in between the truth lies, indeed if there can be any truth, somewhere in between. So one of the, one of the key issues from your book uh, are the sheer number of diverse and really interesting real life characters who populated this, this landmark period in history. Were there any particular characters you felt after the event that you really wanted to bring into the public eye? Albert Ball from from Nottingham. You'll find in the book that a great many of the, the men mentioned, and there are women mentioned, it's not just a man's book, that they are Victoria Cross winners or gallantry award winners because it's easy to access the information about them. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Albert Ball opened up quite a few doors and some of them were what was on the other side was quite surprising to me. For instance, the fact that he is buried in Anouillen in the north of France, a small town there, and he's buried in a German graveyard there. He was shot, he crashed and was killed nearby. Um, also, by their own choice, the students at the local senior, uh, secondary school have named their secondary school Albert Ball College. Also something that came to me while I was researching the book was, and Albert Ball is a good example of this, or at least the information available on him, I went to the Nottingham archives, and uh, he, he was from Nottingham, I should add, he uh, went to the Nottingham archives, and there uh, I got hold of letters he'd written and uh, to his parents, and all very interesting, but there were a whole lot missing. And what had happened is another researcher had come and had got the documents and some of them had disappeared and have never reappeared, never resurfaced. And that sort of thing can happen. Something else that happens with research is people get their own little patch and they don't like other researchers coming in. And although they've got no intent, well, they, there's always good intentions, I'm going to publish but very few of them do. But what they do is tie up a lot of information and don't let anybody else see it. It's a most strange sort of uh, situation. Others are very generous and will. Usually you'll find their family members of the person you're writing about. 
and I was helped greatly by members of a uh, Hudu Kinross's family, Cecil John Kinross, Hudu Kinross, by his family and others uh, who knew of the, or actually knew the family of other figures as well. So, uh, especially with the Clickman and Shire VCs, the, the local the local ones. Now that we're heading for the centenary of the First World War, having completed your book, what lessons do you feel that we can learn today from the conflict and from the people who fought in it? I don't know that there are many lessons to be learned. Since then, small wars, great wars have occurred and we still go on in conflict. You can see it today with Russia and Ukraine and the Crimea and Syria. It all goes on and it doesn't really stop. Uh, we have learned tactically a lot of lessons and but still mistakes are made. Men are lost, women are lost now. Uh, and so, no, I, I don't think there's been a lot to be learned from the First World War as far as the future was concerned. We went on and made not the same mistakes, you don't make the same mistakes again, but similar ones, and ended up in war. Tales from the Western Front is a book which brings out very human aspects to the First World War, and certainly it was one that I found to be very enlightening. Ed, thank you very much for your time today. That's okay. Tales from the Western Front is available to buy from all good independent retailers and online booksellers worldwide. Thank you for joining us today and I hope that you'll tune in again soon.